When I sharply snapped back, Julie yelled at me, Stop leeching off dad. Hearing Julie's angry voice, I made up my mind that it was no use. I gave up in my heart. My feelings for Julie did not reach her. The emotional bond I was trying to establish with Julie was broken. Julie needs to reflect on her actions and face the consequences. I will tell her the truth. My name is Kelly, and I am 53 years old. I have been married to Jerry for eight years. Both Jerry and I have been married before we met each other. I divorced my previous husband because he had an affair. One day when I came home, I found divorce papers from the lawyer in the mail. Since then, my ex-husband never returned. I didn't even know where he was, but I submitted the response to the court. We used to argue a lot and weren't very close, so I had expected this to happen someday. But it was so sudden that I couldn't eat and felt very depressed. I couldn't just sit around, so I threw myself into my work. I filled the void in my personal life with work. I worked frantically and studied marketing and management. Thanks to that, I didn't think about remarriage or dating, and before I knew it, I was 42. My family runs a small diner. It's a cozy place that serves set meals during the day. The food is good, plentiful, and affordable, making it popular with the town's folk. It's a small town, but almost everyone must have eaten our food at least once. My father's chicken steak is the restaurant's specialty. When Jerry proposed to me, I was over the moon, but hearing that he had a daughter made me anxious about the future. Will this work out? The thought of suddenly becoming the mother of an adult daughter was crushing. My happy feelings completely deflated. Now my heart feels heavy and dark. That's when I got a text from Jerry saying, no rush on your response. I meant every word I said earlier. His calm reply soothed my anxious heart like a receding tide. Yes, Jerry is serious and kind. He would support me through anything. As for his daughter Julie, even though she's a concern, she's an adult and won't act like a child. She will understand about Jerry and me. I decided to accept Jerry's proposal. When I told Jerry I would accept his proposal, he was overjoyed. Seeing Jerry express his happiness so openly made me truly glad to have chosen to be with him. Since we were both remarrying, we just had a small dinner to introduce each other to our families. But Julie was in the worst mood I had ever seen. She was irritable and took out her feelings on the staff, saying, So annoying, come on, bring the next dish. I asked her to calm down, and she snapped back, Shut up, don't order me around, old lady. The term old lady took my breath away. I had met Julie a few times before, but this was the first time things had turned out this way. Is this Julie's true nature? After the introduction party, I discussed Julie's behavior with Jerry. Perhaps we should consider postponing the marriage, I suggested. Wouldn't it be better if Julie sorted out her feelings first? Jerry shook his head. Indeed, Julie's attitude today was problematic, but she has already moved out of the house, and we won't be seeing her every day. Being tied down by an independent daughter forever doesn't seem right to me. Jerry suggested that being confined during today's introduction party might have irritated Julie. Normally, Julie is quiet and not the kind to get angry like that. Please give Julie a chance. She's really a good kid at heart, he encouraged. Encouraged by Jerry's words, I decided to proceed with the marriage. I was determined to marry Jerry and live my life with him. Yet every time I saw Julie... I was reminded of that incident, which only increased my anxiety. I started living with Jerry, and we bought an apartment halfway between my company and Jerry's. Julie was living alone in an apartment near her company, so it was just Jerry and me living together. The first three years passed without any problems, and we were happy. The only tough part was during the holiday season when we met Julie, but other than that, it was peaceful. However, in the fifth year of our marriage, we faced a big problem. Julie moved in with us because her apartment was undergoing major renovations. She said the noise and the workers coming and going were too much, so she moved in with us. I had a bad feeling about it, and I was right. 
We turned a room we used as a storeroom into Julie's room. She complained that it was cramped and poorly lit, but we convinced her to tolerate it. For the moving in celebration, we decided to have pizza. When I was about to order our usual delivery, Julie went ahead and placed an order from a famous steakhouse. The dishes from there are delicious but very expensive, about four times more than the food we usually eat. I was about to refuse, but Jerry gave me a look. I've recently realized that Jerry is lenient with Julie. He tends to give in to her whims, and perhaps that's why she gets upset easily when things don't go her way. She generally has an attitude and seems to think of the staff in any store as her servants. I've never seen Julie use words like excuse me or thank you to the staff or even to me. Living with Julie was like that. I was feeling down, but this was too much to worry about from the start. In the end, we ordered the food Julie wanted. When the dishes arrived, Julie complained that it was late. Our order was supposed to be refused at first due to the sudden order, but Julie insisted and made them deliver. She complained that they were late. I apologized profusely to the delivery person while receiving the dishes. The payment, of course, came from our wallet. As I checked the contents of the three delivery boxes, I felt even more stressed. I found two assortments of appetizers and steaks and one box of hot dogs. Puzzled, I laid out the food on the table and began preparing drinks and soup. Julie and Jerry took their seats. Julie poured beer for Jerry, raised her glass with his, and began to drink. To Julie, I must be nothing more than a servant or maid. Jerry doesn't correct her. Is something going on? When I sat down at the dining table, in front of me was the box of hot dogs. I let out a soft um, and Julie looked at me with a smug half-smile. That should be enough for you, she said with a snort, then began eating the appetizers. I had some vegetable sticks while Julie enjoyed the shrimp cocktail, fresh salad, and chicken wings. It was a clear act of spite from Julie towards me. I thought this would surely anger Jerry, but all he did was sigh as he looked at Julie. He offered his box of appetizers to me, saying, have some of this. I nodded slightly and took some portions from Jerry. I was tempted to scold Julie but restrained myself, considering that a confrontation on the first day might complicate our future living together. Moreover, I felt like I had taken Jerry away from Julie. Living with Julie started in the worst possible way. Jerry doesn't talk much about Julie. Whenever I ask about her, he just says, she's at a difficult age, please forgive her. While working, helping out at my parents' house, studying, and doing household chores, I was already swamped. Now I had to take care of Julie on top of everything. Julie is simply selfish. She does nothing around the house. It's hard to believe she lived alone before. Moreover, Julie's requests are incredibly bothersome. Even a single piece of clothing came with a litany of instructions. Which items required dry cleaning? which should be hand-washed, and which needed air-drying. When it comes to food, she specifies supermarkets and even the origin of the products. I usually plan meals based on sales and featured items at the supermarket, but that's not possible when accommodating Julie's preferences. I found myself planning meals while also checking recipes on the internet. As a result, our household expenses have nearly doubled, Julie doesn't contribute financially to the household at all. Even when I talk to Jerry about it, he just says, please bear with it. Unwilling to stir up unnecessary conflict, I chose to tolerate the situation. I reluctantly decided to cut back on work. I was valued and had high expectations at my company, with even hints of a possible executive position in the future. But now, family comes first. I applied for reduced working hours at the company. This decision will likely end any chance of career advancement, but I did it for Jerry and Julie. I've decided to endure. While shopping for dinner at the supermarket after work, I received a call from my mother. She told me that my father had been hospitalized. What? Dad's in the hospital, I said. After hanging up, I hurried to the hospital. Our family home is relatively close by 
so I arrived in about an hour. In the hospital room, my father was watching a baseball game on TV with earphones in. Noticing me, he took out his earphones and smiled. Mom just exaggerated over the phone, he said with a laugh. Relieved, my legs gave way, and I slumped to the floor. My back's been hurting, my father explained. It seems years of standing at work have taken a toll on it. I've decided to go through with the surgery, he told me with a laugh. At that moment of relief, I remembered something important. I hadn't informed Jerry or Julie about any of this. I pulled out my cell phone from my shopping bag and saw countless missed calls from Julie. My heart was pounding as I hurriedly called her back. Julie's voice sounded displeased. Where are you and what are you doing? Hurry back and make my dinner, she demanded. I apologize reflexively. I'm sorry, my dad's been hospitalized. Julie was silent for a moment, but then started scolding me sharply. Huh? Your dad? Your dad really? Julie's tone became vulgar and aggressive. I felt intimidated and shrank back. In a small voice, I replied, yes, he was suddenly hospitalized. And what does that have to do with my dinner? Julie's reasoning was becoming absurd. You're my mother, right? Understand it's a parent's job to make meals for their child. This might be understandable if Julie were still in elementary or middle school, but Julie is 25 and has lived alone before. She's fully an adult. For such an adult to demand meals from a parent is beyond harassment. I felt compelled to stand up for myself. I'm not good with Julie's assertive tone or harsh words. Although I was scared of being yelled at, I decided to confront her. Is it wrong to worry about my dad? You should understand, I said. I could hear Julie gasp over the phone. Shut up, don't talk back to me, she snapped, clearly taken aback. If it were your dad, you'd rush to his side, wouldn't you? Julie fell silent. Maybe she was imagining if it were Jerry who had been suddenly hospitalized. Surely Julie would be worried if something happened to Jerry. That's what I thought. However, Julie's response was shocking. Huh, I'd ignore it if my dad was hospitalized, she said. I was speechless. I wanted to believe it was a lie. Anyway, I said, sorry, but you'll need to eat out today, and hung up. This call made one thing clear to me. Julie doesn't see me as her mother. In fact, she doesn't even see me as a person. She must think of me as a mechanical servant or a slave. Otherwise, she couldn't say such heartless things. It's saddening, but I can't just dwell on sadness. Things can't go on like this. I felt a strong need to take action. Even after my father is discharged, he won't be able to work as before. There's only so much my mother can do. I need to address the situation at my family's home quickly. Balancing my family's needs, taking care of Julie, household chores, and work was impossible. I decided to resign from my job. Though the company tried hard to retain me, there was no other way. Just as my father was discharged and we managed to reopen our shop, something happened to Jerry. He ended up being hospitalized and his condition was quite severe. Dr. Richard, the chief physician, said he might never be discharged. When I informed Julie of Jerry's condition, she reacted nonchalantly and said something unbelievable. Does this mean it's going to cost a lot of money? Julie seemed more concerned about money than Jerry's health. What could this mean? I couldn't understand her reasoning. Does Julie not care about Jerry at all? This is not the time to worry about money. Do you understand? I became emotional and retorted. I know that, but if we don't have money, we'll be in trouble, won't we? Julie pulled out her cell phone and started making a call. Hello, Uncle David? Actually, Dad is sick and has been hospitalized, she said in an uncomfortably sweet tone. I was hoping you could help with the hospital bills, Julie schemed on the phone, trying to get her uncle to pay for the expenses. Then you can ask Mom about the rest. After ending the call, Julie gave me a cold smile, sending a chill down my spine. So you'll have to talk things over with Uncle David, she said, humming a tune as she went back to her room. I was still reeling from Jerry's hospitalization when Julie's actions left me stunned. 
After a while, I received a call from my brother-in-law. I explained Jerry's condition and the outlook for the future. I broke down crying midway but managed to explain everything. I also assured him that I would take care of the hospital bills, so he shouldn't worry. After hanging up, I slapped my cheeks with both hands to psych myself up. I can't afford to mope around over this. But bad things continue to happen. After our marriage, Jerry was entrusted with managing his parents' company. However, the business began to struggle. The cost of raw materials had been rising for years, leading to higher purchase prices and reduced profits. The company was so strapped that it couldn't afford to pay employees' salaries. In the past, Jerry's family used to help my family's business, but now the roles were reversed, and my family was supporting Jerry's company. With the business in trouble, Jerry had cut his own salary, so I was paying for the hospital bills with my salary. Most of the insurance policies list the company as the beneficiary. Ironically, Jerry's insurance money gave the company a bit of a brother during these hard times. In such a difficult time, Julie lashed out at me. The reason was a photo on my phone of a dining scene at a restaurant. Don't mess around using other people's money for such luxury. Julie berated me with vulgar language and an aggressive tone. The photo was from a time I was asked to sample dishes at a restaurant I visited for work. A client took the photo and sent it to me, but unfortunately, it backfired. You're using our money for stuff like this. Julie's words made me realize something. It seems she's under the impression that I'm living off Jerry's money. The reality is quite the opposite. Currently, I'm the one providing for most of our household expenses. I've repaid all the money. I borrowed from Jerry in the past with interest. Julie's anger didn't subside. It seemed futile to say anything at the moment. Julie's command, get out, compelled me to leave the house. I left a single piece of paper on the dining table and chose to spend the night at a hotel. It would be useless to explain anything to Julie. If I tried to explain, she might start depending on my money, and I wanted to avoid that. I resolved to stick to my plan and take appropriate action. I made a promise to myself. I went to visit Jerry's hospital room. I visit every day, but today felt special. Julie didn't come today either. Jerry gave me a sad smile, and his smile always reassured me. I'm sorry for being so inadequate, I said. Jerry shook his head. It's not that. It's my fault Julie turned out this way because of me. Jerry began to share something he hadn't told me about Julie before. Julie is not Jerry's biological child. His ex-wife had an affair and Julie was the result. Jerry found out just before his ex-wife passed away. Hearing this, Jerry felt an indescribable anger. The person most at fault was lying in bed, soon to pass away, and he couldn't direct his anger anywhere. Julie wasn't to blame, and she still thinks of Jerry as her real father. His ex-wife passed away without revealing anything about the other man involved. Jerry was left with unresolved anger. He couldn't treat Julie the same way as before and ended up pushing her away. For Julie, her mother suddenly disappeared, and her father became distant. It's no surprise her personality became twisted. From that point on, Julie ceased to trust anyone, viewing Jerry solely as a financial resource. Since then, I've become nothing but an ATM to Julie, Jerry said with a sad smile. Julie's selfishness is excessive, and her disdain for others is over the top. Julie found out I wasn't her real father when she was in high school, Jerry said. She didn't seem that surprised. She must have had her suspicions, he added with a sarcastic smile. I explained to Jerry what I was about to do. Initially, he looked reluctant, his expression conveying a sense of skepticism, as if questioning, is all that really necessary? I've already looked into it. If I don't do it, things could get even worse, I told him. If I don't, someone else surely will. Jerry closed his eyes, deep in thought. I decided to wait quietly. After a while, Jerry opened his eyes. All right, I'll leave it to you. I held Jerry's hand. His hand felt bony and had become much smaller. 
I struggled to hold back my tears, forcing a smile. I left the hospital room and stepped into the corridor where I saw Dr. Richard. I handed him a scientific magazine showcasing the latest medical technologies. Please help my husband, I said to him and left the hospital. Now it was just a matter of taking action. To psych myself up, I slapped both of my cheeks sharply with my hands. This always helps me focus. After spending a night at a hotel, I checked my cell phone for messages and returned home before noon the next day. I could hear the sound of the TV and Julie's laughter coming from the living room. Julie was watching TV and laughing heartily. It was a rare sight, she's usually in a foul mood, but today she seemed happy. Looking around, I noticed that several things were missing. The photos of Jerry and me, souvenirs from our trips, and other decorative items were gone. Huh, some things are missing, I said to myself, prompting a reaction from Julie. Oh, I threw them out your stuff, she said. Shocked, I entered the bedroom. The room was empty. No computer, no TV, no stereo, even the bed and furniture were gone. The closet was empty too. I returned to the living room and confronted Julie. What's the meaning of this? I demanded. Julie looked at me with disdain while lying on the sofa. They were needless, so I disposed of them, she said. I put my hands on my hips, visibly angry. Needless? What are you going to do? When I raised my voice, Julie made a face of disgust, averted her gaze, and sighed dramatically. I'm tired of living with you, she said. Julie's words were outrageous. What do you mean by that? This home belongs to Jerry and me, I retorted sharply. Julie's face turned sour. Stop leeching off dad she said. Leeching? What could she possibly mean by that? Julie suddenly brought up something unexpected. Come to think of it, she had mentioned our money before. Could Julie be under some grand misunderstanding? As I stood there unable to respond, Julie's irritation grew. Do I have to spell it out for you? I'm saying stop depending on dad's money, she said. Julie and I never got along well but I had always tried to be considerate towards her. I complied with all of Julie's requests, even those that felt like harassment, because I wanted to get along with her. As the second wife, I've always strived to be kind and loving. Feeling somewhat guilty, I still received such treatment in return. I wasn't leeching off anyone. I was just trying to do everything for Julie. I wanted to tell her this, but the words wouldn't come. While I struggled to speak, Julie added insult to injury. Dad's not coming back anyway, so there's no reason for you to be here. That's not true, I replied. Julie raised her voice. Shut up, I don't want to hear your excuses. Hearing her hysterical voice, I made up my mind. It was no use. I realized I gave up in my heart. My feelings for Julie did not reach her. The emotional bond I was trying to build with her was broken. I felt my feelings for Julie fading. Just a moment ago, I thought of us as family, but now we're complete strangers. From the beginning, it was clear Julie was only using me for her own convenience. That's why she could so boldly drive me away. Julie needs to reflect on her actions and face the consequences. I resolved to confront Julie with the truth. Determined, I locked eyes with Julie. Julie looked back at me with fearful eyes. What? Got a problem? No, I'll leave, just as you wish, I said. I checked other rooms, the bathroom, and the toilet. Don't bother looking, everything's gone. I had it picked up by a collection service, Julie said. I picked up a flyer from the living room. That's the place I asked them, she added. The flyer was just there conveniently. This was something I had left in the living room. I almost let out a laugh at Julie's shallowness. Forcing a stern face, I glared at Julie. I hope you come to realize the gravity of your actions. With those parting words, I immediately left the house. As soon as I stepped out of the apartment, I contacted the waste collection service that had emailed me in the morning. The collection service had kept my belongings in storage. Not only did they store them, but they also moved them into the storage unit I had rented. I thanked them politely over the phone before hanging up. 
I intentionally left that flyer on the living room table. I thought Julie might just do something like that, given her personality. Seeking out a collection agency would have likely been too bothersome for her. I figured that if a flyer for a junk removal service was readily available on the table, Julie might be inclined to call the listed number. I was willing to forgive her if she didn't go that far, but Julie went through with it. My patience finally ran out. I went to the hospital to see Jerry. It seemed Jerry was getting some explanation from Dr. Richard when I entered the room. Dr. Richard left as I walked in. Jerry's face was unusually happy. It was a shame I had to bring up such a topic when he was in a good mood. Reluctantly, I shared the earlier incident with Jerry. His face immediately clouded over. But it can't be helped, right? I said, gently holding Jerry's thin hand. Thank you for understanding, Jerry replied. In fact, I had already decided where I was moving to. Anticipating this situation, I had prepared a new place. Even if I wasn't kicked out, there was a chance I would leave on my own. Either way, I needed a new place. I planned to move and start a new life with a fresh mindset. It's just that things are happening a bit sooner than planned. Jerry smiled gently, comforting me. To be honest, being kicked out by Julie didn't really put me in a bind. It just moved my plans up by a couple of weeks. But now I'd have to live in a hotel for three weeks. Maybe it's my frugality that makes me think it's a waste. Regardless, I resolved in my heart to be prepared for whatever Julie might do next. I started taking the actions I had prepared for in advance. Once the move was successfully completed and I had settled down, Julie called me. As soon as I answered, Julie's loud voice filled my ear. You took our money, didn't you? She accused. I played dumb and asked, Huh, what are you talking about? My faint ignorance seemed to infuriate Julie further. Don't play dumb. It's about dad's hospital bills. The hospital just called saying they need to be paid. I was expecting this call around now. Oh that, I replied in a deliberately relaxed tone. I purposely hesitated and sighed. You should pay it. It's not my concern anymore. You have the living expenses that dad transferred, right? Just pay it out of that. That's true, but I don't have the bank book or ATM card for that account, Julie said. Julie should have the insurance documents and bank books, but the account balance is almost empty. The balance is gone. You must have taken it, she accused desperately. The more heated Julie became, the more calmly I behaved. I didn't take it, I said. I said with a composed face, don't lie. Who else could have used it? I struggled to suppress my laughter. Ever since Jerry's salary significantly decreased, there has hardly been any money in that account. A simple bank statement update would reveal this, but Julie probably hadn't done that. There was just very little money to begin with. Even with this explanation, Julie wasn't satisfied. If you can't pay the hospital bills, you should just use your own salary, I suggested. Julie remained silent. Given Julie's spendthrift nature, it's unlikely she has any savings. She tends to spend her salary as soon as she gets it. I knew how much Julie earned because Jerry had previously informed me about her earnings. Moreover, Jerry even used to give Julie an allowance. You're old enough to have some savings, aren't you? I said. I could almost hear Julie grinding her teeth. After a long silence, so long I thought the call had dropped, Julie suddenly raised her voice. What's wrong with me spending the money I earned? Julie continued to rant. You're the one who spent all the money Dad gave us, aren't you? I could hear Julie's heavy breathing. The farce was over, so I got to the heart of the matter. If it's not savings, then use the money you acquired dishonestly, I said. I heard a thud. It seemed Julie dropped her cell phone, probably too shocked to keep a grip on it. How did you know about that? Julie didn't deny it. She had just admitted to the wrongdoing. There was no escaping it now. We will discuss the details when we meet, I told Julie and hung up. I had sent the meeting place via email. I also attached the audio file of Julie saying, How did you know about that? to the email. 
I had recorded the conversation with Julie. It's always wise to have evidence on hand. I had arranged a meeting with Julie, and all that was left was to present my evidence. The next day, Julie showed up at the agreed meeting place. It was the entrance to the apartment building where I lived. I called out to Julie. Julie looked up, surprised. Here? Yes, I sent you the address, didn't I? Julie craned her neck to look up. You live in this tower? She asked, staring at the tallest and most expensive apartment building in the area. An Italian sports car was even parked at the entrance. This place is worth over a million, isn't it? Julie muttered. I led the astonished Julie to my apartment, which is close to the top floor. Even with the high-speed elevator, it takes a while to reach the top. During the ride, Julie was nervously biting her nails and trembling, clearly sensing something bad was about to happen. Upon arriving, I unlocked the door with my cell phone, which also serves as a key. Julie looked at me with a surprised expression. I entered the room without minding her reaction. The living room offers a panoramic view. The apartment we used to live in looks tiny from up here. The living room is spacious with a generous layout, and the kitchen is large. I had Julie sit on the sofa. She was clutching her bag tightly, clearly tense. I made some coffee and handed it to her. Julie took the cup with a rattling sound, trying not to drop it. It's too spacious. It's unsettling, I said mockingly, smiling at Julie. She remained silent. I've been preparing to live here for a while, I continued. Julie must have thought of me as a parasite living off Jerry. No wonder she was shocked. Shall we start the discussion then? This is Scott, my lawyer. I introduced Scott, who was waiting in the back, to Julie. She seemed too overwhelmed to even notice Scott. Her gaze was unsettled, darting around nervously. Ignoring Julie's state, Scott began laying out documents on the table. Julie barely responded to my attempts to engage her in conversation, distracted by the room. Just when I thought we couldn't have a proper discussion, Julie mumbled, How could you afford such a penthouse? Figuring she was curious, I answered, Julie, I just bought it the regular way. Don't lie, how could you afford it? She asked. I had the income to afford it. As my family's small restaurant began to recover, I not only advised but also got actively involved in its management. The business flourished in an exciting way, and I quit my corporate job as I got busier. Julie likely assumed I had become merely a housewife after leaving my job. We turned the small restaurant into a corporation, and I became an executive. The business was doing well, expanding into multiple outlets like a specialty grilled chicken restaurant and a fine dining place. That's why I could easily afford this penthouse apartment, I explained. I earned that much. I shared the story of my family's business. Julie only knew that Jerry had helped when my family's restaurant was struggling. I then told her how my family's business eventually came to support Jerry's company, and that I had become an executive. Hearing my story, Julie slumped in defeat. I wondered if Julie was feeling regret, but she suddenly looked up and said something unexpected. All right, I'll live here too. Let's make up. What is she talking about? I thought, but I just silently stared at Julie. There's enough space here for my room too, right? She asked. I glared at Julie with a cold look. Save your dreaming for when you're actually asleep. She was completely unfazed by my sarcasm. I'm serious, she said. That's when Scott cleared his throat. He probably couldn't bear to go along with Julie's absurd statements any longer. Scott handed Julie a bill. Looking at the bill, Julie's face turned pale, her hands trembled, and sweat formed on her forehead. This is a fraudulent bill. It's a phantom charge, Scott stated. After graduating from college, Julie had worked at Jerry's company. However, she conspired with a client company to make unjust charges to the company. The illicit gains were shared with the accomplice from the client company. To set Julie up, I had hired a detective and conducted a thorough investigation. An individual from the client company who conspired with Julie leaked information to Scott. 
I immediately consulted with my in-laws, who had stepped down from the presidency to become chairpersons, about the matter. They were furious and promised appropriate punishment. Embezzlement on the job is quite the crime indeed, Scott added. If convicted of fraud, you could face up to 11 years in prison, not to mention civil damages. Wait a minute, there must be some mistake, Julie desperately tried to deny it. However, the evidence was complete, and the accomplice had confessed. Admit it. The charges against you are only getting heavier, Scott said. Just as I thought, Julie was gripping the bill tightly enough to tear it. She suddenly stood up. I'm sorry, Julie apologized. Sorry doesn't cut it, I spoke in a flat, emotionless voice. Especially since you've done it habitually, it's deemed extremely malicious. Julie collapsed to the floor and began to apologize. Please forgive me, Julie sobbed. No chance, I replied coldly. Her face became a mess of tears, and her usually perfect makeup was completely ruined. If things continue this way, losing your job will be the least of your worries. You might even get arrested. Julie's apologies wouldn't earn her forgiveness. Her tears and runny nose left dark stains on the carpet. Please forgive me, just staying silent about it is enough, she pleaded. I turned my back on Julie, who kept apologizing. This isn't just between you and me, I said. Julie seemed unable to let go and made an outrageous offer. Then I'll give you money. I'll charge the company again and give you that money. I sighed deeply and pressed my hand to my forehead. Nothing I said would make a difference now. Julie had no intention of repenting. She was solely focused on navigating her way out of the predicament. There's no helping you. You need to be properly judged, I said, revealing the voice recorder in my hand. Julie realized she had made an outrageous proposal. She trembled, covering her mouth with her hand. I'll submit this as evidence to the police, I declared. Julie kept her head down, as if something had been drained from her. Scott and I then escorted Julie out of the room. Leaning against the wall, she staggered toward the elevator. Once Scott had departed, I collapsed into the depths of the sofa, exhausted. It was finally over. I reported the outcome to Jerry via email. As planned, Julie was criminally charged by the company. She was arrested, and the employee from the partner company was indicted. While on bail, Julie had been dating this employee, whether Julie really had romantic feelings is unclear. It's highly possible she pretended to like him just to use him. Julie is now detained in a holding cell awaiting trial. She also faces a lawsuit for damages from the company. Julie was disliked at the company, and perhaps this was a form of retribution. Being the president's daughter, she was exceedingly unpopular among the employees. She also had a haughty attitude toward clients, which negatively impacted performance. Not only was her attitude presumptuous, but Julie also made many mistakes. There were numerous complaints, but no one dared to criticize her because she was the president's daughter. This is what I heard from Jerry. Jerry is still hospitalized, focusing on his treatment. He entrusted the presidency to Gary, his reliable executive vice president. This decision had been made quite a while ago. With Julie gone, the transition proceeded smoothly. Jerry is fighting his illness despite the challenges in getting discharged. A pioneering treatment available in France offered new hope. Holding the published scientific journal, Dr. Richard and I had many discussions. Dr. Richard understood and agreed, and Jerry will soon go to France for treatment. Of course, it's private health care not covered by insurance. I'm not worried about the treatment costs. If necessary, I can just sell the penthouse. Jerry will surely recover, and he will surely smile at me with that gentle smile again. I can hardly wait for that day.